if you don't know your numbers, if you don't know the financial background of the business, I've seen people who sold products and they lost money with every product they sold. And then they were mad at us because we increased their sales with ads and they were mad at us because they lost money with every sale. Hello, I'm your host, John Cavendish, and welcome to season three of the Amazon Strategist Show, the show that's all strategy with no hacks, no silver bullets, and no magic pills, just real practical strategies for your Amazon business. So today we have a very special guest. We have Nadine Schupper, a co-founder of Bidex. I hope I didn't bod bodge that. A platform that automates and, and optimizes Amazon advertising for sellers. With a strong background in digital marketing, e-commerce, and data analytics, she has been instrumental in establishing Bidex as the leading tool for increasing sales and profitability on Amazon. Before Bidex, Nadine worked for KPMG in the field of data analytics and where she honed her expertise in leveraging data for business growth. So Nadine, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. I'm really happy to be here and uh, thank you for having me. Well, welcome. And it's really nice to have a fellow European. I mean, I was European. Now, <laughs> you know, is England's Europe, but a fellow European on the show. So how did you originally get into the Amazon ecosystem? Yeah, well, I was still in college when I met my husband, um, Max, and he was selling on Amazon himself at that time. He was selling baby safety products. And until then, I had no clue. I was just an Amazon um, customer, but I had no clue about the whole Amazon selling ecosystem. And he was kind of introducing me into it. And I started to help him out with packing stuff and everything in the background. So I kind of learned the in and outs about um, Amazon FBA. And at that time he was responsible for the ads. So he actually, he had a partner and his part was also to um, manage the Amazon ads. And my background was uh, computer science and business information systems. So he kind of asked me if I could automate the ads for him because at that time it was 2017, there was no tool that could automate it. And that's kind of how we came up with the idea of Bidex. And Max had the background in Amazon FBA and I had the background in computer science. So it was the easy conclusion for us to um, code our own software. Awesome. I didn't know that. We've talked before at other events and I didn't know that you were the geek <laughs> behind Bidex in the first place. That's awesome. I wouldn't call myself a geek anymore. I mean, we have like we have a bunch of developers now. They are way more, way better than I've ever been. So, um, but I feel like it's, it's really helpful to, um, also as a founder, kind of understand the, the whole development part in the background, um, even though I'm not coding anymore, but, um, it was actually a lot of fun also with my background in KPMG and data knowledge analytics, I always like to solve problems and I'm still like, I feel like most developers don't like bug fixing, but that's actually what I like most. So, <laughs> well, I didn't code in probably four years now but it's it's fun that's awesome though i mean and what you say like any founder that tries to found a tech product without being able to code i've seen you know very rapidly fail or realize they built in the wrong code base or the wrong structure and then have to rebuild again so yeah awesome i mean good that you can be the technical co-founder super cool so yeah so when you started approaching it what kind of campaign types did you initially start with and how's that developed you know over time of running the running the software so like in the beginning, there wasn't much. Uh, when we started in 2017, Amazon ads were like very rudimental. There was, it was only sponsored product ads. And at that time, probably also sponsored brands, but um, it was all pretty simple also with the match types. So also the software we created in the beginning was pretty simple and we kind of had to develop further and further around Amazon. So we started with sponsored product ads and that's always what sellers should do. And then sponsored brands is more for brand awareness and to um, show your products uh, like other pages, not only in the search results. And we also recommend to still use sponsored, uh, sponsored brands, especially in Europe. You have like smaller or lower CPCs for sponsored brands. So it's pretty useful in, in Europe too um, to use them. And then over the time, there was also sponsored display um, that came to um, sponsored ads for Amazon. And with that, you can also do like retargeting campaigns, which is pretty useful. Besides that, you also have Amazon DSP, which is the demand side platform. And the DSP is pretty powerful too. And it's not only Amazon sellers who can use the DSP, but also other providers, let's say like an insurance company could use Amazon DSP. So Amazon is collecting a lot of data and um, we can use this data 
to advertise, for example, the insurance or, for example, a car. And Amazon knows, like, which car are you driving? Do you have a pet? What is your income? They know everything about you because you're purchasing everything there. Or a lot of people do. So yeah. they can use this data. And um, that's what the demand side platform, the Amazon DSP, does. So that's also very, very powerful. But it's not necessarily a product that you should use in the beginning. Ah, so when should you use DSP then? Um, like we usually say that you should start with DSP when you leverage the smaller product ads to the fullest. So when you have when you have like an ad spend of fifteen thousand in sponsored sponsored product ads, that I would say is like an average amount where people start to also use DSP, and then for the DSP you should have like a minimum budget of five thousand a month. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense. So you really have to get some traction there. And DSP is there are two, well, let's say three use cases. First is brand awareness in general. So it's a lot of bigger brands who also use the DSP. Then you have retargeting campaigns there too. And the retargeting campaigns compared to sponsored display ads are way more detailed. So you have more possibilities to actually target these retargeting campaigns. And then um, let's say you have a product. So you can also use the DSP for launch, even if you're a smaller seller. But it makes sense, for example, when you have a product where there is no search volume for it. So it's a very in, in, uh, innovative product, for example. There is no search volume. You don't know which keywords could fit to the product because it's kind of a new product. Then you could also use the DSP and work with audiences instead of keywords there. So that makes sense too. Nice, cool. That makes a lot of sense. And then all of this can be managed within BitX's software, kind of. Yeah, exactly. So we started with the PPC only because DSP wasn't that of a big thing at that time when we started. But then four years ago, we also started to do DSP. And at that time, it was all manually still. So there was no API, but um, Amazon also opened up an API for the DSP. So now we also implemented DSP into our tool and we can actually automate it too. Nice. And and with the way Amazon's changed advertising in the last, you know, really several years can does does the software also support that you know different types of content and you know video ads and everything like that can you can you also manage that definitely yeah so everything that amazon is doing we try to implement immediately too as soon as it's available through the api we have it in our system as well and we are aiming to the point that the seller doesn't have to log in to the ads console at all anymore they can just use bidx and do everything there Oh, I love it. That's really cool. So just to change tack slightly, I know before this, before we started recording, we were talking about day parting, which I'd never actually heard of in that term before. But, you know, whether that's stopping advertising or turning bud budgets up and down, can you tell us a little bit about day parting and how it works and yeah. how we should use it? So day parting necessarily means that you can increase bits and budgets, but you can also turn off the whole campaign. And we use it, for example, for the lead up phase before deal days, let's say it's prime day and then you increase the bits and budgets for the two weeks before the actual prime day. And we also did a study um, internally, which showed that most sales on prime day had a touch point with ads before, within the two weeks before the actual prime day. So it's really important before we have a, a deal day to use this lead up phase and prime the, uh, the buyers to buy your product instead of your competitors. And then it's also when you have, for example, a product that sells very well, for example, at night, let's say you are um, selling a gaming computer. So, and you know, <laughs> your customers are mostly awake at night, for example, and then it makes sense to increase your bids and budgets at night and decrease it during the day, or you are selling I don't know, let's say a mouse for just um, offices and they usually buy their stuff in the morning at 10. So when you see there are any trends and we actually like in our tool, you can see the trends. So you can see like for every day and every hour, you can see um, how the search volume and the um, the conversion rate is for these for these hours. And so you can, accordingly to that, you can increase and decrease your bits and budgets, which is pretty powerful. Nice. So quick clarification on that, because I, you know, I haven't been a seller for a while, to be honest, that I've been a, 
so it's Friday doing what we don't. We fight the good fight with seller support, but we don't. I haven't been an you know advertiser in a while. Back in the day when I was a seller, um, we always thought that budgets took ages to respond. You know, as an average of the weekly, you know, average of the weekly amount. These days, when you change the budget, how quickly does it respond, and how accurate can you be on a you know daily basis if you're playing with budgets? So it usually takes um, only a few hours to to get into account. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that it's like we've seen that also in the past that it took like a few days, but it's not that case anymore. So Amazon also responds more quickly. And now that they also have like the uh, Amazon stream where they also have to be more responsive to what you send to them and then you get like real time data too back from them, they can't really afford to take days to take new changes into account. So there's no longer an average of the week. So you, if you increase it and decrease it and it spend more, it doesn't it doesn't affect your days further down the week by changing that anymore. Yeah, no. Oh, awesome. Cool. Well, I learn something new every day. Super cool. What kind of stuff have you seen experience work the best in terms of day parting? What works best for your clients? Yeah. So what we really like is it, for day parting, you can not only do it like based on the um, search volume or for the... Um, for the conversion rate, but you can also do it based on the bestseller ranking. So let's say you have your product is at place 10 right now, but you really want it to be in the top three, then you can also increase the budgets and, and boost your product with that. And we see that a lot. And what you can also do is based on your um, inventory. So let's say your inventory is low and you don't really want to spend more money on advertising because you don't want to sell out your last products with ads, then you can just decrease uh, d decrease your budgets and bits too. So that's what we've seen a lot that people use and where they're really th thankful for because there is no other solution, which else uh, actually helps you with your bestseller ranking or your um, inventory level. Nice. And I guess... Can you set up automations in your software? So this, if this, then that, because otherwise this would be a lot of work if you're doing this yourself in the back end of Seller Central. Exactly, yeah. That's how we do it. You just create some rules, how you'd like to have it, and then the tool's doing everything for you. And we get the best seller ranking um, on a daily basis. So we know what your product is ranking right now. We know your inventory levels from Amazon or from third-party um, tools too. And then from there, we can optimize it. Very cool. Yeah, I, that sounds like an awesome tool. I wish I had had the tool in the past. <laughs> Thank you. Just out of interest, so once you've once you're doing the standard optimization, standard. I mean, do you have what options do you have in terms of optimization? Can you optimize towards ACOS or TACOS or ranking? Like, how, what can people optimize towards inside the tool? So with Embedx, it's the ACOS, it's the TACOS, it's the budget, and it's the bestseller ranking. So. Um, that's what, and still, like most of the people still optimize towards the A cost and the take cost. And I mean, that makes sense, especially the tacos became pretty popular over the past years, I would say. And um, yeah, we see that a lot still in use for our clients. Well, what do you think is best? Um, I would also use the tacos or the bestseller ranking. Uh, depends on what my need is. What do I want to achieve? Like, is it a launch and do I want to have like the most brand awareness or is, yeah, am, in which phase of my product am I? Do I just want to um, like make money with the product or do I want to build a brand? So that's like always kind of the trade off. And then for like big brands, they usually work with budgets. So they have like strict rules. We have a budget of 20,000 a month for this product and we don't want to exceed this. We don't really care much about the ACOS or the TACOS or whatever, which is insane in my opinion. I mean, when the ACOS or TACOS is very good, I mean, spend more money on advertising in that case so that you can like leverage everything. Like you Make can also profit. like, yeah, more profit. You can increase your ranking. You can maybe like when you sell more, you can get like lower prices for buying your stuff in China or whatever. Like it's the whole ecosystem like around it, like the, the flywheel of PPC, how we call it. And um, but still like bigger brands still want to use their budget system. So we provide it. I love it. This sounds really cool. OK, well, there's one more question on my list, which was about uh, working with your spouse. 
And, uh, you know, personally, I know we talked about before, I've, I've worked with my spouse, but only for a short amount of time. I mean, how, uh, how has it been co-founding a company together and working hand in hand for the last many years? Um, I would say it's like, it's challenging sometimes, but it also has its advantages. So, um, like also in the beginning and still now we are traveling a lot together and we are experiencing a lot together. So Max and I spent the last three years together in the U S for three months each. Uh, because we opened up a U.S. subsidiary in 2021. So um, we are traveling a lot. We are experiencing a lot. And so we are also grow together, kind of. But it's also challenging to go home and then have your spouse and co-founder there. And, of course, we are still talking about um, company stuff there, about any issues that we have. And sometimes it's really hard to say no let's just be a couple now and not talk about business anymore um but it's also fun i mean it's like best friends in life and business so it's kind of fun too that's awesome yeah and it's really cool working with people you're very good friends with i know spouse is different but still like uh it's very good working with close friends because it just makes things yeah more enjoyable doesn't it and it's also like max and i we really complement each other so um and what i think is really important i would not be the person who would found a company on my own i would always want to have a founding team and um, when you found a company in my opinion it's very important that you have like different skill sets and that come together and that you complement each other and for example he is he is the visionary he's always thinking big and i'm like more detailed i'm more analytic so and and at the same time i'm also more emotional so it's it's kind of a good mix which makes it successful for us to build a team and to grow the company that's amazing it sounds like an amazing partnership yeah thank you i would say so (laughs) so changing tack slightly we are going to the next part where we talk about our most debatable or controversial opinion related to the Amazon or e-commerce industry. Like, what's your controversial opinion, Nadine? <laughs> yeah, uh, my controversial opinion is that I feel like there are a lot of coaches and also agencies or providers out there who just promised you to become a millionaire quick, especially for coaches, but also agencies for different, like, all over agencies, but also PPC agencies who just um, promise you if you invest a thousand here or if you use our system, you will become a millionaire quickly. And I definitely believe that Amazon FBA is something where you can become like rich with if you put in the efforts and like a little bit of starting money. But um, it's definitely still, it's still a job. You still have to put some efforts in it. It's not that you just buy products in China, put them on Amazon, and then it's running itself. You have to put the efforts in it and you have to be aware of it that you have to do something for it. And when deciding for a coach or when deciding for an agency, you should always like listen to what they're selling you. Are they realistic? Do they have realistic targets? And also have a look to reviews and um, see how trustworthy they is. Do you feel comfortable with going with them? Or do you feel like it's kind of sketchy? Yeah. And are they selling you on the lifestyle or are they selling you on some kind of actual concrete plan? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. I mean, it, it's a real business. And if you do it wrong, yeah. you can also like get yourself in trouble. So if you don't know your numbers, if you don't know the financial background of the business, I've seen people who sold products and they lost money with every product they sold. And then they were mad at us because we increased their sales with ads and they were mad at us because they lost money with every sale. So that was kind of, okay, uh, we should, or you should think over if this really makes sense for you right now. It's uh, totally agreed. I mean, the easiest way to make a million dollars with a business is to start with $2 million and start a business. You (laughs) can end up with $1 million. That sounds a good plan. Yeah, we should do that. Yeah, yeah. 100%. 100 percent that's how we become millionaires okay awesome i like that that's cool so thank you so much for being on the show nadine um if anyone wants to get in touch with you or bidx and learn more how, what's the best way for them to do that 
the best um, for me would be to contact me via LinkedIn. And you can find me under my name, Nadine Schöpper there. And if you want to get in touch with Bidex um, in general, you can use Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or our website, bidex.io. So there are multiple ways and we will always um, find you if, you if you want to get in touch with us. Okay, awesome. Yeah, on LinkedIn, I would search for Nadine uh, Bidex. Because if I try to spell Schoppe, <laughs> I will get out of picture. Yeah, that works too. You're right. Awesome. So thank you so much for being here, Nadine. Um, it's been amazing having you on the show. And thank you to all of the listeners and everyone listening in. So if you found this episode useful, please do go check out Bidex. Um, do that, watch the demo. And also come back here and like the show. So if you're wherever you're watching, whether it's Spotify or a Apple Podcasts or YouTube, click like, click follow. It just helps us out in uh, getting more reach. So thank you so much for being here, Nadine. And see you all next time, everyone else. Thank you, John. It was a pleasure.